Hello and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by BMT Infonet, GBHD Caregivers, Building Resilience for the Road to Recovery. My name is Susan Stewart and I'm the founder and executive director of Blood and Marrow Transplant Information Network or BMT Infonet and I'll be your host for today. If you're not familiar with BMT Infonet, we're a not-for-profit organization that provides transplant recipients and their loved ones with high-quality, easy-to-understand information about bone marrow, stem cell, and cord blood transplants, and CAR T-cell therapy. We have many publications, a peer support program, and a website that has lots of valuable information, including information and videos about GVHD. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Pharmacyclix, an AbbVie company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, and Insight Corporation, whose support in part has made today's webinar possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Michelle Bishop. Dr. Bishop is a clinical and health psychologist with 25 years of uh, clinical experience helping patients and families cope with cancer survivorship and caregiving. She authored a pioneering study on the well-being and needs of caregivers for the stem cell transplants and has counseled and led support groups for caregivers of GVHD patients. She has served as an advisor on numerous federal and private projects to enhance the quality of life for caregivers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Bishop. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to spending this time with you today. And thank you, Sue, and your team at BMT InfoNet for making this webinar possible and for your tireless dedication and devotion to addressing the information and support needs of individuals and families dealing with BMT and GBHD. The focus of today's presentation is on family caregivers who are caring for someone with GVHD or graft versus host disease. My goal today, oops, my goal today is to focus on the unique challenges of GVHD for caregivers, to describe the effects of GVHD on caregivers' mind and body, and to underscore the importance of self-care, and to discuss ways of coping and building psychological resilience for the GVHD journey. You know, we often use the word journey when we talk about cancer and transplant survivorship and caregiving, and I think it's a way to appropriately and correctly acknowledge that the whole experience is really more of a marathon than a sprint. There are a lot of ways that it's like a long road trip uh, with different phases and chapters. Um, and, you know, for most people, it's not a trip that you planned for. Um, most of you listening today may have already been on this road for some time. You could say this journey started uh, with a diagnosis of cancer or other blood disorder. Um, there might have been a treatment phase even before BMT, then BMT, and now GBHD. As you may have already experienced, and as typical of um, the GBHD portion of the journey, is there can be lots of unexpected twists and turns, detours and roadblocks, sometimes smooth sailing and sometimes stormy weather. It's also a road trip where we don't actually know the final destination and we don't know how long it's going to take to get there. So it's really quite different than if you have a broken bone or a specific surgery where there's a beginning and a middle and an end and then we kind of get back to where we started. Given this difference, we need to prepare differently and cope differently, which is really what this talk is about. Also on this journey, we'll see that caregivers are the ones that are in the driver's seat for the most part. And in some ways, they're the whole vehicle that everybody depends on. So that's the metaphor we're going to be working with today. So who are we talking about when we refer to caregivers? Um, lots of different people. It can be spouses, partners, parents, adult children, siblings, friends. Typically, there's a primary caregiver. Um, they're the givers of care in this journey. But when we're talking about care, we're not just talking about physical or practical but also emotional support, um, social support, and even existential and spiritual care at times. Many family members don't actually identify as caregivers. You know, they'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm the partner, I'm, I'm the parent. You know, of course, I'm, I'm here to, to support and provide care. And that is true, of course. But you also are taking on caregiver roles that are specific to the situation, and they're important to acknowledge. 
You're what we call informal caregivers as opposed to professional caregivers like doctors, nurses, and home health aides. This is an important distinction because unlike, unlike professional caregivers who go home at the end of the day, you're on the clock 24-7. And in addition, along with the patient, you're living the experience of cancer, BMT, and GBHD yourself. So in that way, you're also co-survivors or sometimes called secondary patients. And we don't really have a good term to, that encompasses both the caregiving aspect and the co-survivor aspect. So that's why you'll see I use the term family caregiver to try to acknowledge both parts of that experience. And I kind of see you as both taking the hands of the patient in offering care as well as walking hand in hand with them. So in the context of BMT, the family caregiver role is particularly important. In fact, having a caregiver present is often a prerequisite to getting a transplant in the first place, given how tough treatment can be and how the patient needs help and care as they recover. Um, the caregiver provides you know, care to the patient, but also manages everything else, if you will, home, family, work, so that the patient can focus on recovery. And the caregiver role, of course, doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's not like the world stops. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that the caregiver is often also juggling multiple roles. Um, there are new roles related to BMT recovery, and essentially you're getting kind of on-the-job training. Um, there might be some temporary added roles that perhaps the patient used to do but can't at the moment that you take on. In addition, there are interpersonal role dynamics that are affected. So what I mean by that is, for instance, if you have a partnered couple who are used to sharing kind of equal roles in their relationship, they may now experience unequal roles of, let's say, nurse and patient, where one um, partner is more dependent on the other, and that isn't always easy. Um, and all these roles change over time and also according to the phase of the journey. So what are we talking about when we talk about these roles? There are so many. Um, there are obvious roles related to medical care, and we might put those in the category of nursing roles. So hands-on care, monitoring of symptoms, trying to determine when and if medical care is needed, um, could be managing medication or wound or skin care. Um, there are roles related to being um, an advocate for the patient, especially when the patient is very ill or fatigued. So this might involve gathering and digesting medical information, um, being the go-between between the patient and the doctor and helping um, them understand each other and make sure important information is transmitted. Um, another role is as communicator to family and friends, providing updates, fielding calls of concern and well wishes, perhaps even being a bit of a gatekeeper and deciding who, who visits the patient and for how long. There's quite a lot of work in terms of managing the medical care, like scheduling and getting to appointments, coordinating help. And then, of course, there's managing all the things at home, like finances, home care, yard care, child care, pet care food prep, um, and lastly, being a cheerleader, if you will, to the patient and family members. Um, so a source of psychological support and trying to keep spirits up and be strong for others. And interestingly, in the literature, it shows that actually is one of the um, more challenging aspects of um, being a caregiver. So there's some additional special challenges that often come with GVHD. Um, in many ways, it's more like a whole new illness that one is dealing with. Sometimes patients and families talk about having traded one set of problems before transplant for another set after. Um, often, you know, this part of the journey, as, as this part of the road trip, as we talked about, lies unpredictable terrain with unexpected twists and turns. Um, multiple body systems can be affected, and treatments such as steroids or immunosuppressants can add their own challenges. Um, and it really can become a chronic disease that lasts for months and sometimes even years. Um, because GVHD requires specialized treatment, in many ways it's, it's more like a rare disease. Um, and because of the physical changes and, um, and being on immunosuppression and different aspects, it can lead to a sense of isolation, physical, psychological, social, both for the patient and the caregiver. And so um, 
it's not really a surprise that that can tip the scales and feel pretty overwhelming at times. So given all this, it's not a surprise that, you know, we know from the literature that BMT caregivers experience distress. And interestingly, their levels of distress are typically um, similar to patients and in some cases even higher than patients. Um, caregivers also report physical and emotional fatigue, uh, struggle to balance the needs of themselves and those they're caring for in their family. You know, many feel a great sense of responsibility um, you know, for the well-being of their loved one. And of course, a sense of uncertainty and fear of unknown and guilt sometimes if they feel tired or if, if they um, identify their own needs. It's, of course, often harder when the patient isn't feeling well or not doing well. We tend to worry more. Um, or when outcomes are unexpected. And the issue of expectations is an important one in terms of psychological adjustment and something we're going to talk about today. There are also positive outcomes. Um, folks do talk about newfound strengths, closer relationships. Um, growing and, and um, finding kind of gifts along the way. And so it's important to recognize that it's, it's not all negative. In terms of the long-term impact, there actually are not that many studies, and we are hoping that uh, more are in the works. Um, and there are two studies, um, one that I was involved with, this first one, that um, surveyed spouse caregiver uh, couples um, who were two to 23 years post-transplant, an average of seven years transplant. And we asked them questions about their current quality of life at that time. And interestingly, we found that both reported fatigue, cognitive challenges, sleep and sexual problems. The patients were worse off than the caregivers, but the caregivers reported some of those symptoms as well, um, more than a, a, a control group, which were peers that were matched on certain criteria like marital status and education. Um, the caregivers actually reported less social support and more loneliness than the patients and the survivors themselves. Um, they had an increased risk of depression compared to their peers. Um, and they tended to be less likely to be getting help. So those survivors that were experiencing depression were more likely to be getting help than the caregivers who were experiencing depression, for instance. There was another study that looked at um, an average of six years after transplant and found that the majority of caregivers were still providing some care to the recipient, and about 20% reported a poor quality of life. Um, now, we know from the general chronic caregiving literature, research literature, that that experience, that long road, can negatively impact the immune system. There's kind of a wear and tear that can occur. Um, and so it's really important that we, um, you know, help caregivers um, take care of themselves as well as provide support for their both physical and mental health um, and well-being and so that they don't get ill as well. Um, but there are also studies, again, um, positive ones that indicate that caregivers can be hardier and actually live longer than non-caregivers. And I think a lot of this, again, speaks to that um, growth and resilience that we're going to talk about. So um, again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You might think about it as an ultra marathon. Um, and it's really a different mindset. It's learning how to live with GBHD and adjust to this ongoing journey and thinking about what you can do to keep going and have a good quality of life. So in that vein, we're going to talk about a roadmap uh, to resilience. Um, and one of the amazing things I found about working with folks who are dealing with cancer, BMT, and GBHD is the incredible resiliency of the human spirit. Um, and the great thing is that we can build up and enhance our innate ability to cope and to overcome challenges. So what do I mean by psychological resilience? I mean the ability to adapt and recover and bounce back for, from challenges. You can think of it almost as a kind of buoyancy. Um, it's, um, it can be about believing in one's ability to cope, to problem solve, to be able to deal with difficult um, events and emotions, and to be able to persist and persevere. Essentially, it's the ability to weather the storm and, and to remain standing. 
So there, there are lot, actually lots of different factors that contribute to resiliency, um, but I'm just going to focus on these five today that I have found important in working with folks dealing with GVHD. And these are confidence, social support, self-care, flexibility, and finding meaning or purpose. And I think and I hope that you're going to see through this presentation how they're actually interrelated and positively impact each other to build um, this resilience. So let's start with confidence. So it's really about building a confidence or competence base that we draw from that helps us to persevere and to problem solve. Now, of course, we don't typically start out that way. We don't start out confident. Uh, typically, we start out pretty scared and nervous and uncertain. But amazingly, over time, and actually generally pretty quickly, families and caregivers in particular really start to build a confidence and a competence base in these new roles. The thing is, if you're at the point of dealing with GVHD, you've already dealt with cancer or, or diagnosis of a blood disorder and BMT. You already know a lot. You've gotten this far. So it's really about building on and adding information and skills to what you already know. Now, most caregivers say transplant centers do a good job in preparing um, families for transplant and early recovery. Um, but sometimes patients and caregivers feel a little less prepared for the transition home when the caregiver really slides into the driver's seat and, and the burden of care is, is more squarely on their shoulders. So you could think about learning about um, that transition home and particularly with GBHD is kind of like planning for the next phase of, of this road trip. And just like you would do in preparing for a road trip, you might do some research and seek resources and talk to others who've been down that road before. Try different things out, find out what works for you. Um, and that helps with that persevering and persisting and developing realistic expectations. The great news is that others have gone down this road before you, and they're great sources of information that are specific to the GBHD phase of the journey. The three main patient advocacy organizations that I always turn to um, in this area are BMT Infonet, of course, uh, National BMT Link, and Be The Match, uh, which is formerly known as the National Maradona Program. They all have excellent written materials, online information and presentations such as this one, um, as well as um, direct support. Um, BMT InfoNet hosted a GVHD summit last year for patients and caregivers, and all of those presentations are on their website. The Meredith Cowden Foundation uh, put on a national GVHD symposium. Be The Match has a Living Now series that takes families through what they might expect the first couple of years after allogeneic transplant. Um, all of these organizations um, have peer-to-peer -peer programs, and I wanted to take a minute to really focus on those. So I have to say there's no substitute for talking with someone who's been down the road themselves and who get it without you having to explain a thing. Um, not only is there just this sort of sense of, of relief that you don't have to explain, but because they've been down the road, they've learned valuable tips and tricks that sometimes even the medical team isn't aware of. Um, you realize you're not alone. Um, the, it's pretty easily accessible through the telephone and, and internet. And all three of the organizations I mentioned have, have peer to peer support on call. And BMC InfoNet um, has run a GBHD caregiver support group. Um, I was privileged enough to, to be able to um, be involved in one of those groups. And I have to say, I was really amazed at the sense of community that was created in that support group. Even though the caregivers were dealing with very different circumstances, some were um, spouse caregivers, some were parent caregivers, different, different uh, times on even just the GVHD journey, there was a sense of um, community and care and belonging um, and support from one another um, that, was really, that was really beautiful. It was really um, amazing. So this leads us to the second resilience factor, which is social support. So peer-to-peer -peer support is um, obviously a, a very important part of support, um, especially in the context of e GBHD. But family and friends will likely be providing the bulk of the day-to-day -day support. Um, it's, it's important to remember that support can take many forms. 
Um, I mean, many different kinds of people can, can be sources of support and different forms of support. So not just, again, hands-on, but also social, emotional, financial respite. Um, although the GVHD landscape has its unique aspects, there are a lot of social support tools that still apply. So you might think if we are working with the road analogy and the car trip, you might think about social support as, um, as your pit crew um, and kind of your toolkit for the road. Um, and there are ways that they're, they're kind of also your emergency toolkit. Should something happen, these are also people that, that you can call on. So they can keep you going um, and, and as well as, as call, um, you can call on them if there's um, an emergency. So you may already be aware of some really useful technology tools um, that can be used um, to communicate updates uh, to your support system and to coordinate help from them as well. Um, you know, given the longer time period involved with GVHD, some of these tools can be especially helpful to keep people in the loop and to help them understand what you're dealing with um, and have a centralized place to post updates where people can um, see what's happening or sign up for help can decrease your burden so you're not having to individually, um, you know, send emails or make phone calls or answer, you know, answer phone calls. The other thought is um, one thing that can be helpful is to appoint somebody in your support system to, to be the person who um, posts things, um, on, you know, posts updates or manages the uh, calendar system. So you may have heard of this you know, free web pages called Caring Bridge or MyLifeline.org, um, and this they're they're private, um, they're they're password protected. You give your loved ones a password, and you can post updates, you can post pictures, and then folks can can write responses and replies. Um, for the coordination of help, these other uh, ones like Lots of Helping Hands or Cure Zone Meal Train have calendars or lists and you can indicate what you need, and then folks can look at that and sign up for, for um, different things that they can offer. Now, there are some challenges to GBHD support that I think that are important to acknowledge. Um, you know, sometimes the support system, the family, the friends, may not really understand what GBHD is or that it is this marathon, that it is sort of a whole new set of things that you're dealing with. Um, it can be hard to ask for help and to keep asking, particularly if we are looking at a, a path that, that might be more on the order of months and years. Um, the support system can fatigue, of course. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, help is not always helpful. It's not always exactly what you need. So just some thoughts, some tips about ways to manage help. You know, one thing that actually um, a GBHD survivor mentioned in uh, a networking group was when she talks about GBHD to her family and friends, she tells them it's kind of like multiple sclerosis. Um, and I thought that was a really great idea. So GBHD is such a specific thing that most people you know, don't know about, but you might try putting it in a framework that other people might be familiar with and might be able to understand. Um, so it could be multiple sclerosis, it could be Parkinson's. It's of course very different, but it just gives them a general idea that this is more of a longer term chronic disease. Um, you could point them to the GVHD information resources that, that we mentioned. Um, maybe they could read some of those or look at some of the, the webinars online. Um, one thing is to be ready with a list when people ask how I can help. Um, so you might in, in your mind or even keep a little list in, in, your, in your bag of, of the different things, you know, gosh, it would really help if you could run to the grocery store for me, if you could, um, you know, take the, the patient to a doctor visit. Um, in terms of that fatigue of the system, tapping multiple sources of support and remembering people that we, 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 we don't always remember, you know, like coworkers or neighbors. Um, oftentimes people are so glad to help, they really want to help, and it's a gift to allow them to help. They just don't really know what you need or what to do. And so um, letting them know actually is, is super helpful for them. Um, there are ways to be creative, so to make it kind of fun. So I worked with somebody who um, 
they really needed help with yard work. They did not have the bandwidth to do it. And so they would, every couple months, um, typically at least seasonally, have a yard work party and invite as many people as they could who would be coming, who would be willing to come and do yard work for the afternoon. And then they would order pizza and soft drinks and have a, a, a bit of a party. Um, so they're creative ways to make it work. I think one of the most important things and the differences with GVHD is um, is building in support for the long haul. And um, if there's anything that you can unload and give to somebody else to just do for the foreseeable future, do it rather than having to ask again and again. And so, um, you know, maybe if you have a child who needs to be picked up from soccer practice, you arrange with a parent that they just do it and you just you just have that off your your uh, off your own table. Um, so now we're getting into self care, and I hope that at this point you're beginning to see how important you, the caregiver, are on this journey, and how much is riding on you and your well being, and that you really are in the driver's seat, but in some ways you're you're the vehicle as well. And so if you think about it, like what happens if you break down? If you break down on the side of the road, it, it really affects everybody. And so you taking care of yourself is actually a way that you take care of your loved one and your family. It's not a selfish act. It really is um, an important aspect of providing care. But I get that it's super hard. Um, folks talk about they feel selfish thinking of their own needs. They're not the ones that are sick. They don't have time. If they don't do something, they feel like it won't get done. Um, they don't want to bother other people or they shouldn't need to take a break because they're strong. Um, and I hope you're beginning to see how taking care of your physical and emotional health is not, it's not only not selfish, but it's one of the best ways you can care for your loved one. Um, it is a lot to deal with, but you want to work smarter, not harder, if you will, and use available tools and resources like social support. It helps you conserve energy, helps you go the distance. Um, and that taking a break is a sign of strength, um, not a sign of weakness. So self-care um, really encompasses all aspects of health and well-being. It's not just physical, but it's emotional, social, spiritual. Um, Again, you might think about that car analogy. If you were about to take a long car road trip, one of the first things you would do is check your car. Make sure it's in working order. Um, make sure the tires are pumped up. Make sure the battery is okay. Because you don't want to get caught on that road um, with, with a car that's broken down. Um, and then, of course, you would keep checking along the way, making sure everything is, everything is okay. And that's a way to think about um, your own care. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of maintenance, but also monitoring and, and building in to daily practice, both the checking and the self-care. So um, this maintenance model, I hope this analogy is working for you, but um, it's really like how can you keep yourself strong, working strong? Um, and what I mean by working smarter, not harder, is if you think about like a car can run on flat tires, um, but it takes a lot more energy. It takes more fuel, and it causes a lot more wear and tear on the car, and it could even cause damage. I mean, you could think about that even with, with oil. Like if you don't put oil in the engine, you might be able to go partway, but at some point the engine's going to seize, and then it's really a problem. And so this idea of prevention um, and, you know, keeping things up, helps you to go the long haul and helps you not have to have to work quite so hard. Um, you know, one thing that occurs to me is we typically now in, in this day and age with cell phones, we're really good about plugging in our cell phones. We get home, one of the first things we do, plug it in, make sure it's plugged in all the time, make sure it's charged. We don't want to get caught with, with a dead battery. If we could embody that same folk, you know, that same orientation for ourselves, that would be great. So just always thinking about how can we recharge. So physical well-being, I know you all are familiar with these. Um, you know, it's things like nutrition, hydration, staying, you know, hydrated. Um, any kind of movement and exercise is important. It doesn't have to be going to the gym. Um, trying to get sleep and rest. 
Um, you can think, you know, broadly think about yoga, massage, acupuncture, other ways of really taking care of, of your physical well-being and being mindful of unhealthy coping. And it's understandable that we might eat more or we might not eat as well when we're stressed. Um, and in the short run, you know, it's, it's okay, but in the long run, it really undermines, um, again, that, that strong, healthy body. And it's important to keep those checkups, those tune-ups, your own medical appointments um, to make sure there's nothing kind of brewing. Um, how do you do it? I get that it's hard. Um, you know, there are different ways. You know, it's sometimes it's tr trying to do it first thing before the, the, your, your uh, loved one gets up in the morning. Um, you know, going, sitting outside with a cup of coffee and just getting some time to recharge and some quiet time to yourself. It could be going for a walk. You might look for windows of opportunity. So if you're um, in a waiting room or arrive at an appointment early, you know, could you leave your loved one in the waiting room and you, you go take a, a walk or go up and down the stairs a little bit and just stretch your legs? Um, thinking about it as a priority and, and scheduling it and protecting the time. You could do it with someone else, uh, do it with something you enjoy, and that would be combining social support and some pleasure as well as, um, let's say, movement or exercise. And if you, if you can, notice the difference, and it, that will be reinforcing if you realize, God, it makes, I feel so much better when I, get, when I take the time to do this. I need to remember to do it. So in terms of coping with stress and tension and that kind of wear and tear on the body, can think of two things. One is to burn off the stress. So that's more um, movement, stretching, exercise, physical activity, which actually helps not just with the physical well-being, but also um, with sleep and mood, depression, anxiety. You can also think about turning it off. So helping the system kind of come down and calm down with relaxation techniques, prayer meditation, respite. There are a lot of really good apps now that are free on the phones that, that have different re relaxation, um, guided imagery, um, recordings. Those can be great. In terms of respite, you need to unplug. You both need to unplug. Um, sometimes the medical can feel like it's, it's there all the time and you're always thinking and breathing it. And so taking a break from the medical or even from each other and having a support person come and stay with your loved one while you take a break. Doing something that helps you feel normal, like reading or um, walking or uh, crochet. I mean, th those aren't, you know, um, superficial things. Those are actually ways that you can recharge your battery and take time for yourself. Um, there are lots of feelings, and folks talk about the emotional roller coaster of this journey, um, swinging from fear, hope, frustration, relief, guilt, gratitude. Um, and there are a lot of losses that you, the caregiver, experience yourself. So, you know, the loss of your imagined future, how, you know, the things that you guys used to love to do together um, and can't do now because of physical restrictions or, um, you know, immunosuppression or fatigue, um, you know, issues of identity or work and so forth. And so it's important to... Uh, process some of those and, um, and, and, and kind of give voice and work through them, uh, particularly when caregivers often feel the need to hide emotions or be positive or not burden and they kind of hold that all in. So there's different ways to do that. Um, there's actually quite a lot of research on the very, very positive impact of expressive writing. Um, so writing deepest thoughts and feelings about um, a stressful event for a limited period of time, like 20 minutes at a time, and doing it sort of repeatedly. Um, it's kind of like journaling, but it's more focused. But it, it, it's interesting. It's similar to talk therapy it, in that it is a way of um, both expressing and processing the, the thoughts and feelings. Um, and obviously, there are other ways to do it as well, as you see here. Um, and it could be talking and sharing with others. Um, but the idea is to give voice and to essentially grieve these losses, um, which helps us to get to a point of accepting, okay, you know, this is what it is, and how can I move forward and make the best of it? Um, so that acceptance is not surrender. It's really the freedom to move forward. So one, um, one thing we can think about is trying to, to build in a kind of daily check-in 
Um, could be in the morning where you sort of check in with yourself or periodic through the day. How am I feeling physically? How am I feeling emotionally? And so forth. Kind of like when we get in our car and we check, you know, is there gas in the tank? But if you forget to do that, the good news is you have a built-in system that is going to tell you um, for you. And I think about that as the warning lights on the dashboard. So if we forget to put gas in the car, there is, there is that little signal that lights up, you know, or if the car starts to overheat, it tells us. And we human beings have a similar system. And so if we start to feel certain um, emotional or physical symptoms, they're warning signs. They're kind of trying to bring attention. It's like a little bell saying, hey, you know, pay attention. Something is off balance here. So you might, you know, just keep an eye out for signs of burnout or, or changes. Um, if you're feeling down, if there are weight changes, you find you're, you know, using more caffeine, um, not taking care of your physical needs as much, um, crying easily or feeling irritable or having any kind of physical symptoms. These are all um, ways that our body has this wonderful system to bring attention, bring awareness, so that we can address those things. Of course, if you are experiencing significant symptoms of depression and anxiety, please get in touch with your own doctor. Another source of support, and I think of this both as social support and as um, support when those warning lights are going off, is individual professional counseling. Um, and so, you know, the great thing about this is it's private, it's confidential, it's scheduled time for you. Um, we generally, we're really good about making appointments. Sometimes we're not so good about making um, time for ourselves, but if we have an appointment, we'll go. Um, and it's time where it's just you. Um, and there's no concern about burden. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, burdening anyone else. Um, families and couples counseling can help with problem solving or if you have any communication difficulties or issues of intimacy, sexuality. Um, and insurance, you know, covers this um, usually, or you might be able to tap your employee assistance program at work. Um, so really think about this. Um, it, you know, and I see folks this way, and I really think about it as normal people going through abnormal circumstances. Um, and so really providing that, that help and support. Um, it doesn't have to be that you're experiencing, you know, major depression or, or generalized anxiety. You can be experiencing milder adjustment issues and still really benefit from counseling support. Um, so uh, here's another one, which is flexibility, adaptability. So one of the things about this road, it can feel like you're constantly rerouting um, and recalibrating and there's a detour and you have to switch gears. Um, and that, that can be, you know, that can be challenging. And so one thing is to try not to look too far ahead. Just take each day as it comes and kind of do the best you can, control what you can, um, you know, focus on your health, focus on, you know, the day-to-day -day and in a sense not try to look too far ahead. Um, I think really importantly, give yourself credit, use self-compassion, gentleness. You know, you're, you're, this is a tremendous job you're doing and it isn't easy and you're doing the best you can and you're learning on the, on the fly and there are no mistakes, it's just, it's just learning. And being able to have a sense of gentleness with yourself, a sense of humor, um, and, and being able to engage in creative problem solving together to find new ways of doing things. Um, if the old ways aren't working, um, you know, it's, you're, you're not alone and your survivor's not alone. You're all in the car together and you can, you can problem solve together and come up with um, new ways of doing things. Um, and I think hopefully you see that the more kind of mentally pre prepared you are in terms of expectations and information, socially supported um, and physically and emotionally strong, the better you'll be able to, to quickly adjust course as needed. So if you think about it, if there's something in the road, if your tires are pumped up and you're alert, you're going to be able to swerve no problem and m navigate those unexpected, um, you know, things that come in the road. And so that's how all these things come together. So lastly, the last um, area of resilience is perspective and meaning. Um, it's important to periodically stop and get out of the car on this road trip and kind of take stock and notice progress and see how far you've come. I've worked with folks who felt, you know, discouraged. They felt like, wow, it's taking so long for me to feel better and, 
um, you know, the fatigue is still so bad. But when we kind of, and, and they, they were often ref, referencing before transplant, but when we kind of stopped and zoomed out and, and looked at, well, how were you feeling during transplant and immediately afterwards, the person was able to say, wow, I actually have come a long way. And yeah, of course it's not where I was pre-transplant, but boy, have things improved since transplant. Um, it can be important to remember why you're doing this. And one thing that is amazing, even when it's challenging, the vast, vast, vast majority of, of individuals and families will say, I would do it again. I would do it again. Um, give yourself a lot of credit. Consider a gratitude diary. So that is a way of really bringing to mind, um, bringing forth, if you will, all the positive things that, that, um, that come up along the way. And there really are a lot of things. And that's the thing about humans. We're incredibly resilient. Um, so many folks talk about how rewarding caregiving is. What a sacred gift to be able to care for someone, especially when they're very vulnerable. Um, it changes our sense of, of appreciation for life. Um, and it's amazing how caregivers will say, I, I never thought I could do it. I never would have imagined I, I could have come this far and um, been this strong. Oftentimes, folks feel closer to one another. They feel a greater sense of compassion. Um, and it feels good to give back. It feels good in those um, when they see another family or in those peer-to-peer -peer, um, connections, um, ways that the you know, things that they share that then makes the path a little easier for somebody else. Um, and that's very, very powerful. Um, so lastly, in summary, um, I hope this has given you a sense of uh, how crazy the road, the GBHD road can be how you guys as uh, caregivers are really critical to, um, you know, to the success and, and well-being of, of your loved one and of your family and of you, and that you're in the driver's seat and, and you're in a sense the vehicle as well, but that um, there, you can build resilience for this journey. Um, and in building confidence, competence, and grit to persevere problem solve, building social support and connections that help provide help, respite, and a sense that you're not alone, building in self-care and self-awareness, and understanding that checking in with yourselves daily, if you can, and heeding those dashboard warning lights um, is essential to, to being able to manage this road and continue on the journey, building your capacity for flexibility, adaptability, um, and, and understanding that this is the nature of, of, the, of the road trip, these unexpected twists and turns, but with confidence, social support, self-care, maybe a little humor, patient tolerance, we're better able to shift gears and navigate more comfortably those hairpin turns and not get discouraged by the traffic jams. Um, and finally, building capacity to keep perspective, find meaning and purpose, notice the small kindnesses and blessings along the way, we're better able to weather those storms and bounce back from the challenges and embody resiliency. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Bishop. That was a great presentation. <clears throat> I learned quite a bit. I'm sure others on the call did as well and probably have some great ideas to share. Now is the question and answer portion of the presentation. If you have a question or if you have a comment, please use the chat box at the lower left hand of your screen type that in and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. And we have a few already. Um, this one actually I may be able to answer. Andrea wants to know whether Be The Match provides services to allogeneic stem cell transplant patients where the donor was a family member rather than an unrelated person. Um, and I can tell you the answer to that is yes, they do uh, for the most part. If you're talking about financial aid, there will be some restrictions on that, but in general, the social services, the psychosocial services, and all of their website information is available to people who had a transplant with a donor from the family. Um, we'll go to Suzanne. Suzanne had an interesting question. She said, can you discuss the way the relationship can change when the primary caregiver turns out to have an actual or potential cancer diagnosis? Mm, that's a great question, and that very much speaks to, um, 
you know, the fact that these experiences don't, don't just happen in a vacuum where everything else holds still and there's only one thing to deal with. Um, and, you know, sometimes absolutely that's the case where um, the, the caregiver or other family members may have medical issues going on or other issues that are going on. Um, you know, so, you know, there's certainly not a simple answer, but I, I think about, um, you know, I think about issues of balance of, there may be ways that each person can try to support the other, but certainly it's going to be especially important to build in a lot of that um, outside support to the extent that that's possible, um, whether it's other family members, whether it's friends. Um, you know, it could be having folks take over more of the um, the, the transplant survivors needs, um, you know, let's say getting, getting them to, you know, to their appointments or taking care of their needs so that the primary caregiver can then have the, you know, the, the space, the bandwidth, the time, the energy to go to um, their own appointments. Um, you know, um, you know <laughs> it's, it, it's hard, it's hard what I would want to do is, is ask more specific questions in terms of, of what the particulars are in, in that, um, you know, family situation. But, um, but I guess I, I think generally about really expanding out all of these ideas where you're, it's, it's like both the, the transplant survivor and the caregiver are in the center, both um, providing some care to each other, um, but really more, it's about each of them needing help and support and then trying to balance that, you know, that help and support. Um, but that's a really, you know, it's a really challenging situation. All right, this next question comes from a GVHD patient. Um, he wants to know if you have any suggestions uh, for caregivers who stubbornly resist the idea of taking some time away for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I really appreciate that the survivor is the one who's saying, you know, please, please caregiver, please take time for yourself. Um, you know, because sometimes it's, it's, uh, we forget about the caregivers and, and their needs. So um, that's fabulous. Um, you know, so one, one thought is, and, and you probably have already tried this, but to say, he, you could put it in, in your terms. So to say, you know, what would really help me? What would really feel supportive to me? What would be a way that I feel like you could, sh you know, show, I mean, you're showing me how much you care in so many ways, but here's, here's actually another way you can show me, you know, how much you care about me is to take care of yourself because I'm starting to worry about you um, and I will feel less worry or I will feel less guilt or I will feel less burden if I know you're doing everything you can for yourself. It really helps me. It's actually a way that you provide care to me. So you kind of help them understand that, um, you know, again, it's not, it's not a selfish act and it sounds like you're worried and it sounds like maybe a little frustrated too because you, you understand how important it is. Um, you know, I think sometimes um, uh, connecting with other caregivers can be helpful because you can hear it from them maybe more easily. Folks who have been down the road and who have said, you know, yeah, I thought I thought I could do it without, you know, taking time for myself and then I ended up getting, you know, getting ill myself or I realize now how important it was. And so, you know, sometimes it's easier to hear it from others who have who have been down the road. Um, you know, I think as a psychologist I would I would want to try to understand what, you know, what's getting in the way. Um, is it is it that they feel like it's not okay in some way? Um that they feel, you know, sometimes caregivers will feel like if they were to step away and something happened, they would never forgive themselves. So they sort of feel like um, they have to kind of be there all the time. And so then it's more of a problem-solving um, issue of, 
you know, building in someone else um, who can, that's kind of the respite care model, so someone else who might be able to come in and um, be present that the, caregiver, that the caregiver trusts so that they can um, take some time for themselves. So, you know, sometimes it's, um, you know, it's, it's looking at like what psychologically is happening. Sometimes it's more of a problem solving issue. Um, sometimes it's, it's getting information, understanding, um, you know, that it, there, there can be a wear and tear and um, it, it can affect health and, and ultimately not only is that bad for the caregiver, but it's, it's not good for the patient either. So hopefully there was, there was something in there that was helpful to you. It's a great question. All right, another good question is actually from somebody who's going to be a caregiver for her brother-in-law uh, whose transplant has been postponed for a couple of reasons. Uh, she said, you talked about the treatment center providing good information about what to expect during and after the transplant. I do not feel that the hospital is doing a good job of preparing us for the future. I've done a fair amount of reading and research, but my brother-in-law is very reluctant to look ahead. Do you have any ideas about how to talk with the center about the lack of preparation and also encourage my brother-in-law to be ready? That's a great question. And, you know, it is amazing, um, you know, how different centers are different in how they uh, prepare uh, patients and families and caregivers. Um, you know, I think if you aren't feeling like you're getting what you need, it sounds like you're already doing uh, an excellent um, job step yourself, which is researching yourself. And hopefully some of the resources we talked about today, um, th those, you know, particularly those three organizations um, w are, are places that you have found helpful information. Um, that that will meet those informational needs that you have. Uh, and certainly, of course, always talking with folks who have been through it before um, is helpful. You know, it's interesting what you're saying about your brother-in-law not being somebody who perhaps wants to look too far ahead. There, it is interesting, like people are different. For some people, um, getting information is is a primary way that they cope and they find it really helpful. So the more information they get, the more equipped they feel, um, the more ready, um, you know, they've got expectations, they, they know what to do and where to go if they need help. But interestingly, for, and so they're information seekers, for others, it actually is more anxiety provoking. Um, and they're actually called information blunters. Um, and so they're folks for whom information starts can start to make them feel anxious and overwhelmed. So, you know, I don't obviously know um, you or your brother-in-law. I don't know if that fits this particular scenario, but I think it's it's sort of maybe finding a balance and and um, you know, kind of being being curious and being gentle about. Um, you might notice, you know, it, it could be that more information isn't helpful for him, even if it's helpful for you. And if you're going to be the caregiver, that actually might work out okay because, um, you know, you're going to be prepared and be able to, to again, know, know what to do. Um, and he'll be able to rely on you, um, how lucky he is to, to have you uh, in that position. Um, and so, you know, you can have conversations with him too about, you know, what, um, you know, what might be, you know, c can he say what might be helpful or does he find it overwhelming to get a lot of information? Have there been any past experiences um, of, you know, I don't know, challenging times and that you could draw from and say, oh, remember in that, in that case, it was helpful to have information or, or maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't. Um, and, and then certainly, you know, communicating with the transplant center. And I, I think when, you know, sometimes when you find resources, it's, it's useful to bring it back to the transplant center, particularly maybe the transplant coordinator or social worker, case manager, you know, the team and say, you know, um, I'm, I realized I didn't feel like I, I had all I needed. I found these great resources. I wanted to kind of bring them to your attention. This might be helpful for other patients. Um, and that's a way that you also are, are giving back and making the road easier for, for those to come. So thanks for the question. Thank you. And we have two more questions, and I think that will be all we have time for. 
Uh, the first one is from a caregiver. It says, I traveled cross country to care for my brother for the first hundred days or so, but I need to go back home to my life and my spouse. Yet I feel worried because there's no other family member to step in. What can I or should I do? Uh, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, what that brings to mind too is that um, caregivers sometimes are caregiving from a distance. Um, so I think, you know, how, how wonderful that you were able to be there during that more acute and early recovery phase. I imagine there'll be ways that you will continue to provide support and remember that support, you know, takes many forms and it can be the emotional support or checking in or um, even helping the patient problem solve um, issues as they come up. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a if you're in a position where um, you could help the patient or identify someone in the patient's locality, a, fr a friend, maybe or or a neighbor um, who's like a point person there, and then you you kind of touch base with them with the patient's permission, um, and and then maybe together you kind of support each other to support the patient so that local person might, um, you know, be able to help with some things, um, at least be a, an emergency backup or provide some transportation or be able to help identify other people that are, that are right there uh, close by. Um, you know, if it's near a transplant center, sometimes the transplant center or um, um, like some doctor's offices actually have case managers and social workers who, who, who work in outpatient settings. Typically, that's a more geriatric setting. But um, sometimes tapping um, local community resources, a, again, the one I'm thinking of is more for older folks, but like elder care, elder options, but there might be other ones through the United Way, so kind of local um, uh, community-based Support that might not be cancer or GVHD or BMT specific, but might still be able to provide to provide help. So um, it's tougher from a distance, um, you know. And and you can sort of see as you go, because as we talked about, the landscape changes. So you know, the extent to which your uh, family member needs help may may wax and wane. But uh, but hopefully that that might give you a, a few ideas to to just get started. All right, and then our last question, and I'll chime in here as well. What advice do you have for caregivers in the time of COVID? And I just want to chime in and let folks know that uh, next or on Tuesday, November 10th, BMT Infinite will be hosting another webinar called COVID-19 Winter Update on what transplant recipients need to know. Uh, so that might be one thing that you can do. And, and Dr. Bishop, do you have any other suggestions for how caregivers can manage in the time of COVID, be it uh, keeping their patients safe or uh, it could continuing to have some social interactions, even though we're being told to distance. Yeah, so I'm so glad that that you're um, you know providing the the, the webinars and and um, those very focused um, presentations. They're so needed at this time. Um, you know, when we, um, the last GBHD caregiver support group that we did was this spring, and it was right in the midst of the beginning of the pandemic. And so this was definitely an issue that was coming up a lot. And, um, and here's a, a little bit of humor um, that came up, which was that a lot of the caregivers were saying, you know, they, they were so used to having to deal with precautions like wearing masks and washing hands and so forth from caring for their transplant uh, survivor, that that aspect, um, you know, was pretty familiar to them. And, and um, they were kind of veterans there. Um, but, you know, of course, there is the added uh, anxiety of, um, of possible exposure and, you know, that both for their loved ones, but for them, like if they, if they were to get exposed and then um, expose their loved ones, just, you know, a tremendous sense of, of responsibility there. And so, you know, being extra, extra careful. And, and of course, it creating a greater sense of, of social isolation. 
Um, and some frustration too sometimes. I mean, it, it's different in different communities now, but um, you know, there was a time when the caregiver couldn't go in with the patient for the patient visit. Um, that again, that varies. Um, I've had some, you know, caregivers who what they've done is the the they, the patient goes in to see the doctor, but they have the caregiver on the phone with the doctor, you know, or, or on on um, you know speakerphone, so they they can actually be present in in the visit. Um, Certainly, one, one to your point, Sue, in terms of the social isolation, if if available to you, um, using the internet, using Zoom or other video conferencing like FaceTime. So the phone is 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 helpful, but it really is amazing um, how the difference it makes to see somebody in person. And um, you know, it, it, like any experience, and you know, whether it's GBHD or whether it's the pandemic, you know, there are these these um, kind of um, little bright spots that come through and, and I've, you know, worked with folks who, you know, ended up seeing and connecting with um, family and friends or, or even uh, celebrating birthdays, let's say, together on Zoom um, in, in, way, in ways that they wouldn't have if they had been in person. They would, they would, you know, these are people who were far away and they wouldn't have been local and, and part of the celebration. So um, in some ways, folks have felt you know, reconnected or more connected, but obviously it's different than in person. Um, some folks have been very creative about if you live in a place that's not too cold or not too warm outside to um, to get together with a lot of physical distance outdoors with masks, but at least to be outside um, and to be able to see people in person. Um, so of course, again, there's the resiliency of the human spirit, that ability to be creative. Um, but there's no question that it's adding a whole other layer of challenge. And particularly for those who need help from the outside to come in, um, you know, really um, trying to, if, if you can, you know, make sure that those organizations are doing all they can, you know, in terms of home health and so forth, um, you know, in terms of precautions. And so it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge for, for all. All right, and with that, I think we'll need to end the webinar. If you would like to re-listen to Dr. Bishop's presentation, we have recorded it, and it will be available uh, for viewing just by clicking the same link that you clicked in order to get into the live presentation, or in a couple of weeks, we'll have it on our website, and you can visit it there. Um, if, as you leave, you'll be asked to complete a survey, please do that. That helps us understand what's helpful and what's not so we can do a better job for you in the future. And if you have any questions and need any sort of assistance, I want to make sure that you know that you can contact BMT InfoNet. Our email, our phone number, and our website is on the screen there. Even though we are not all physically in the office, we take our phone calls from our home and respond very quickly. So please do reach out to us if you have any questions or any needs, because that's our purpose. So have a great rest of the day. Again, thank you to Pharmacyclix, an Abbey company, and Janssen Biotech and Insight for making this webinar possible. And we thank you.